I'd just like to welcome you uh, and extend regrets for Dr. Helgeson, who had planned to do this presentation, the apple tree portion of this presentation today, <clears throat> and due to unavoidable conflicts, he can't be here. And both personally to reconnect with colleagues he really wanted to be here, and also to share his excitement about uh, this topic and about our tobacco cessation program. So regrets from Dr. Helgeson, and uh, we'll do our best. We, we were making jokes about it taking two people to cover uh, Dr. Helgeson. But. Yep, yep. So why are we presenting about this today? <clears throat> and why might you be interested in this? Um, tobacco addiction and the consequences of it are very serious. Uh, in Minnesota and in the United States. It is a leading cause of preventable death and is associated with a myriad of deleterious oral health, oral systemic health effects. And oral health professionals are concerned, health advocates are concerned, public health folks are concerned, um, people that are examining the costs of care are concerned. And on a, on a human life perspective, each year in Minnesota, tobacco is responsible for over 5,000 deaths and $3 billion in preventable health care costs. And I feel like given where we are today, it's also important to mention oral cancer. And again, in human terms, uh, the Minnesota Department of Health reports that each year, these are recent statistics from uh, 2011 through 2013, that each year there's new diagnoses of oral cancer for just over 500 men and uh, just over 230 women. So uh, that's a fairly high incidence. And, and oral cancer is kind of a concern too in terms of it can be asymptomatic until it's found and then at that point there's a possibility for uh, 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 other tumors to show up later. So it's a serious issue on a personal and a healthcare system level. And our, our two objectives today, uh, just basic plain language, is we want to share with you some information about coalition, coalition level activities. So uh, Molly from Clearway, Minnesota will be talking to you about their organization and all their advocacy efforts and about Minnesotans for a smoke-free generation. Um, which is a sister coalition, uh, Apple Tree is a member, and the Minnesota Oral Health Coalition is a member. So I think as you hear things that may be something that you personally or your organizations would be interested uh, in being involved with. So Molly has great information about uh, the issues underlying their work and about the work that they're doing. And then uh, Karen from Apple Tree will talk to you about our um, grant funded activity to set up a tobacco cessation program to benefit our patients. So very um, uh, promising and exciting effort to really integrate this care and actually to integrate tobacco cessation with our medical colleagues too so that we're working together uh, on behalf of our patients. So uh, those are our two main objectives when we're uh, done with the presentation and take your questions. We hope that uh, we'll help. Uh, shared that information with you. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Molly to talk about the coalition level tobacco cessation activities. All right. Well, I'm Molly Moylanen, and I'm Director of Public Affairs at Clearway, Minnesota. I'll tell you a little bit about Clearway. I also chair our statewide tobacco prevention coalition called Minnesotans for a Smoke Free Generation. And like Bill, I am also a registered lobbyist at the Capitol. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about Clearway, Minnesota. We're an interesting organization. We were founded in 1998 with a tobacco settlement when the tobacco industry settled with the state of Minnesota for $6 billion. $200 million of that was put aside, 3%, to create Clearway, Minnesota. And so we are funded outside of the legislature. We are funded with those tobacco settlement dollars. And I, and I, I, I believe that if we weren't, that all of those dollars would be gone too. Because for the most part, those dollars that came through the tobacco settlement have been reabsorbed into government. But in Minnesota, we're a unique entity in that we were um, outside of the legislature and we were given a 25-year lifespan. So we will sunset in 2023, if not before. So at this point in time, we have about five or six le years left of our to fulfill our mission of reducing tobacco's harm for the state of Minnesota. And we're going to use every penny and every minute to the best of our ability to have the biggest impact. Yeah? When you said um, 
we're going to sunset it in 2023. Yes. Or, or it might be sooner. That's is that right. Because of money we've run out. Or why would it be sooner than the sunset? Well, we have to sunset by then, and we have a limited amount of dollars. And so if we think we can make more impact in a shorter amount of time by using those resources faster, we might do that. You know, it could be that we go right up until the last minute, or we could year end, you know, six months or a year early, just depending on how we want to um, kind of focus those efforts in these last five or six years. The goal is to land the plane on the runway, so we've just really made the, the biggest impact with those limited resources and the time that we have left. Um, and yeah, so like I said, our, our sole mission is all around tobacco use. It's really interesting to work in an organization that has a sole mission um, and has this limited life. It's very motivating um, for me, and I, it's a really interesting experiment in terms of the type of organization it is. Um, a little bit about our programs. First and foremost, cessation, we run quit plan services, um, which is, you know, we provide um, the statewide helpline for anyone who wants to quit smoking, uh, free services to all Minnesotans. And unlike most states, most states have a helpline for the uninsured that goes to the Department of Health. We provide that helpline in Minnesota. So if you are uninsured, un uninsured or underinsured and you call our helpline, um, we'll make sure that you get cessation treatment or we warm transfer you to your insurance provider who will get you the, the, um, the care you need that way. Um, we also work with priority populations, really working hand in glove with communities that have higher smoking rates and have been targeted by the tobacco industry. So that's been a priority um, for the organization since its inception and it continues to be a top priority. Mass media, we fund a lot of the media campaigns, not only promoting quit plan services, so we make sure people know about the services that are available, but we also do mass media around social norm change, making sure people understand the harms of tobacco use um, and really helping set the stage, make it ripe and ready for policy change um, so that we can move policy at the Capitol if we have that good um, environmental awareness that you need to advance policy. No, jump on in. So who does the ads where, you know, like the kids get on the roller coaster? That's us. That's you? Yes. Love it. Yes. I totally say that. Yes. So we, um, there's a lot of national campaigns too that come into Minnesota and those are great, but we coordinate with them so we're not duplicating and we really make sure we're, we're in the right markets at the right time. So some national campaigns and then for the most part, anything that you'll see in terms of TV campaigns. Um, our, our Clarion Minnesota funded efforts. We sometimes produce our own and other times we'll borrow from other states. So you might remember um, seeing the one where kids are sitting around looking at the candy flavored um, tobacco products. Yeah. Yeah. That idea was an original North Dakota idea. They ran it in North Dakota a little bit. Then California kind of stepped it up a notch and had a higher quality commercial. We took the California commercial, added the Minnesota specific information to it, um, and so that really cuts down our costs, obviously, too. So we share a lot of our ads with other states, um, and then we also try to use other ads from other states that, that will work with whatever we're trying to advance. And we just got done shooting two new ones. Um, it's kind of good, it's going to be our last mass media campaign um, that we'll do under with Clear in Minnesota. Um, and so that, that campaign will launch at the middle to end of January. And it's all around stopping the start, preventing kids from ever starting to smoke. So the campaign line is stop the start, and I think you'll like both of the concepts. I won't go into them today, but, <laughs> but it's, it's coming out. Yeah, no, just jump in any time. Um, in terms of public policy, we do a lot around policy advancement because policy is really the number one tool we have to reduce smoking for population base. Um, work. And then we fund research. Um, we want to learn more about addiction and make sure that our services are right on and really understand sort of how all of our work around tobacco prevention and cessation is working and so we can be the most effective and share that information with others as well. We fund uh, the Mayo Clinic, the University of Minnesota, other Minnesota partners to do a lot of the research. American Indian Cancer Center, yes, you're, you're like, I, are you a Clearway do you know, do you have is the work you're working on right now through a Clearway grant? Um, not mine specifically, but we have a couple different Yeah, right on. Okay. And then um, we do this all through research and partnership, so we can't do it alone, and, and that's a lot. Uh, so when I talk about cult mission work, you'll see that really in play. 
Um, I thought it would be interesting just to take a step back and make sure that we were, you know, kind of all grounded in, in the tobacco use in Minnesota right now. Um, if we look across our population, our adult smoking rate in Minnesota is just over 14% at 14.4%. Um, that's down from 16.1% in 2010. And you can see how we compare to the national numbers. So consistently we've been a low, below the national rate um, over time, but that gap has increased too. So we're making more progress as a state over time. Um, than the national. National rate's going down too, which is great. We're going down as well and a little faster. And I think that's because we have not only great policy interventions, but really great cessation infrastructure in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. That said, while we're re really proud of this progress, we have to make note that there are tremendous disparities um, among the smoking population in Minnesota. Um, much higher rates in some populations, most notably in the American Indian community, which you know clearly about in the work that you do, um, but also other groups too. Um, LGBTQ has a much higher rate than the state average, as well as low SES um, communities um, and uh, African Americans as well. I also wanted to put up this slide, another group that has much higher rates than the average is, um, uh, is the community disparities in tobacco use related to mental health status among adults in Minnesota. So we'll see that um, adults will have almost two times uh, smoking rate will be twice as high who have ever been do diagnosed with a depressive disorder. And, and, um, and so we see that across a lot of um, different me mental health issues. I also wanted to point out that uh, the Minnesota Medicaid population um, smokes at about twice as high rate too as, um, uh, as the main population. In terms of other tobacco product use in Minnesota, you know, it's really not a lot. Um, overall, it's, it's, you know, around three, four, five percent, and we're seeing um, that use go down, which is great. The one exception to that is around e-cigarettes. Um, this data is from 2014, and you'll see the big jump there. It's still, we're trying to still figure out what the baseline is, because this, this is kind of a new thing. We're just starting to collect data in it. We're seeing a lot of people try it, but we're seeing a lot of people never go back to it. So maybe here they said, yes, they used it, but we're really seeing this in the continuum. We're seeing a lot of people who use it every day or people that try it once and never try it ever again. So we're still waiting to see where this trend you know, finalizes and kind of lay, uh, ends up um, kind of flattening out. Um, but right now we know that there is more, more use and we can talk more about that if people are interested. Now let's talk about youth prevalence for a moment. This is data that is just hot off the presses, 2016 Minnesota sur student survey data here. Um, again, we see great trends in youth use going down. Um, right now, the 11th grade r smoking rate, which is kind of our benchmark, is at the lowest it's ever been, ever recorded at just over 8%, which is fantastic. And this is down from 12.2% just three years ago. And again, I think some of the policy interventions that we've made, spe especially around tobacco taxation, just keeping prices high, has been a, a big driver for this. Um, but there are, there are other pieces too that layer into this as well. So we're really happy about um, these data that, again, were just released a couple weeks ago. Um, however, we do see with the youth population disparities as well. Again, much higher rates for low SES population, LGBT, and American Indian, um, uh, as well as groups that have other, um, that have other um, mental health disparities um, just like we saw with the adult population. So that's really, really where we need to turn our attention and make sure we're doing everything we can to impact those populations. Um, and then in terms of other tobacco products besides cigarettes, same thing overall, you know, lower rates across the board except with e-cigarettes. And this is where we're seeing a lot of experimentation with e-cigarettes. And this is a concerning because we know that kids that try e-cigarettes are more likely to then try combustible products which have you know, the highest cancer rates for sure. So that's something we wanna continue to watch and again, see how this trend kind of evens out or if it continues to go up. Um, okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about our policy work now. Um, research and practice, yeah. I just said, yeah. Um, first of all, yes. is, is there a map of where there's more, are there places geographically in Minnesota where there's more smoking? Do you know that? 
Yes, uh, the the adult rates from 2014 with the Minnesota da Adult Tobacco Survey for the first time we really looked at geographic region and generally the smoking rates are higher in the northern part of the state mm -hmm. and lower in the in the southern part of the state. Mm -hmm. And I don't know with the youth data they might have done stratification by geography I think so um, I can check on that and get you that but they do it by district in a lot of cases so we are able to get le down to like district level or county level data um, so yeah you can see the the differences there too but overall we are seeing higher rates kind of north of the 94 you know um, uh, high, highway you know 94 it's like that is a yes thank you mm -hmm. Um, so, in addition to having a robust cessation infrastructure in Minnesota, another strength that we have has been a leader in public policies. Um, Minnesotans for a Smoke-Free Generation is our latest iteration of our statewide tobacco prevention coalition. We're really focused on policies that will reduce youth from ever starting to smoke. And you'll see that as I talk about what our big four policy priorities are. This is for the most part the same group of organizations that helped pass the Freedom to Breathe Act, the smoking <coughs> ban back in 2007 as well as the tobacco tax increase in 2013. In this kind of iteration of our, of our coalition, we've really tried to reach out to additional organizations and new groups um, to be a part of this effort because we think our umbrella vision of preventing kids from ever starting to smoke is really shared among more and different diverse types of organizations. So for the first time, Apple Tree is part of the coalition and the Minnesota Oral Health Coalition is also part of the coalition, which is fantastic. Um, so any of your groups that want to join, please, we can talk afterwards. It would be great to have you on board. The more, the merrier. Um, and you don't have to donate any money or really do anything except say, yes, we support this mission and vision. Um, this is kind of an interesting chart. I thought I'd throw it in, um, and I'll try to explain it as much as I can. Um, we were able to do a model where we were able to track the smoking rate in Minnesota with the interventions that we've had in play versus if we would never have had those interventions. And we would have seen a decline in the smoking rate, yes, even without our interventions in Minnesota. But with those interventions, we saw a steeper. So what is that gap? What really caused that gap? And the number one driver of that gap was price. So higher tobacco prices, we were able to measure and demonstrate, had the biggest impact in driving down the rate. In addition, smoke-free policies played a big role, mass media campaigns played a big role, youth access played a, played a role as well, and then cessation played a role too. But you'll see how, when I talk about price being king when it comes to preventing youth smoking and really helping people quit, this is one um, data set that just really helped underscore that for us as we were trying to pass um, and help pass a big tobacco tax increase. Um, so the smoke free, uh, the coalition, the Minnesota for a Smoke Free Generation, through a planning process, you know, we looked at over two dozen different policy interventions, and really what emerged as the big four, the big four drivers that we wanted to adopt as our policy priorities to really work on over the next five, six years at the Capitol, we came up with these four because we think these four are the ones that are going to have the biggest impact. And I have up here our materials and a fact sheet on each of these, so feel free to take notes but also you'll know you'll have all of the information right here in the fact sheet. The first two are like proven practices, best practices by the CDC, keeping the tobacco prices high and fully funding tobacco prevention efforts. And then the second two are emerging or promising practice that we're really excited about, but we don't have you know decades of empirical data that show that they work, but definitely threads starting to show that they do have really strong promise in reducing youth smoking. Um, so that's restricting the sale of flavored tobacco products, including menthol cigarettes and raising the purchase age from 18 to 21. So I'll just kind of walk through each of these uh, pretty quickly here. Um, like I said, price is king when it comes to preventing kids from starting to smoke. Every 10% increase in the real price of tobacco reduces the number of youth who smoke by more than 5% and the number of youth who start smoking by 10%. That's, that's really motivating. In 2013, our coalition worked with the governor and legislators to pass the biggest tobacco tax increase in Minnesota history, and I think equal to the biggest tobacco tax increase in national history. We increased the tax on tobacco products or on cigarettes from 123 per pack. We added a dollar 60, and now it's gone up another seven, 
15 cents, so it's at $3. The state tax is $3 per pack on, a, on, on cigarettes. That moved our rankings from 28th in the country to 7th. Um, what I just kind of keep coming back to when I think about the impact here is that through our models, this showed that we will prevent 47,000 kids in Minnesota from ever becoming addicted to tobacco. So that's, that's real motivating to me when I think about um, this policy change. What was really cool too is even though when we were at the Capitol trying to convince legislators to include this big tobacco tax increase for public health purposes, we could say this is what we think is going to happen based on all this modeling that's been done and examples from other states. Now we're able to see the data play out. We're seeing big declines in youth smoking. We're seeing big declines in adult smoking. We're also um, hearing directly from smokers who said, yes, I made a quit attempt. I stayed quit because price just really was what motivated me to do that. So here are these data. After the 2013 tobacco tax increase, we went back in 2014 and asked people about what happened when this big jump happened. And they said 60% thought about quitting, 44% made a quit attempt, and 48% cut down on their cigarettes, which is great. And then through this, we saw the adult rate drop to the lowest rate it's ever been recorded at two. So again, that's really motivating and helpful to go back to legislators to say, see, you know, we said it was going to work, and here it's playing out in the data right here in Minnesota. I just want to note that, that despite our successes, there was absolutely an active opposition working against us trying to um, prevent this, not because of, uh, you know, not because you know, we don't want new taxes, but because they wanted to keep people addicted, because they wanted to addict the next generation. So there are tobacco lobbyists all the time that we're working against, and, and still over the last three years we've had to play a lot of defense, and you bet we're going to have to play more defense again this year to prevent rollbacks. Um, so uh, if you see action alerts around this, please help out and contact your legislators. Um, the second intervention is around funding. The CDC says that states should address tobacco's harm with comprehensive, sustained programs, including community and systems-based interventions, cessation services, mass media campaigns, public policy activities, and research. And the CDC goes further to tell every state, this is what we think you need to spend on tobacco prevention to make the progress that we want to make. Um, and so they tell Minnesota it's about 53 million per year. Minnesota invests about 24 million. And of that, clearly Minnesota's dollars is about 16 or 17 million. So the state itself is investing very little um, in tobacco cessation and prevention. And that's, that's a big challenge and this is concerning to us. I think what's even more concerning is you compare how much is spent on prevention annually to how much the tobacco industry is spending annually in Minnesota on their marketing and that really makes it a stark a stark difference um, in in terms of like you know what we're really up against here's another way to look at it too um, we have a lot of dollars coming into the state through the settlement ongoing settlement pay payments from the tobacco industry that's about 160 million and then we have over 600 million coming in from tobacco taxes and the prevention spending from the state itself, not from Clearway, but from the state itself, it doesn't even show up on this chart, so we have to blow it up. Um, and it's right around uh, five million compared to well over, oh, I don't know, 800 million. So that is, again, a really stark um, contrast between the two. There are definitely ways to do this. We think that you know reclaiming some of those uh, state tobacco settlement funds for cessation and prevention would be a good idea, would make sense, um, or dedicating part of the tobacco tax to these um, efforts would make sense, or having a separate appropriation from the general fund. So that's something we're going to continue to work on. It's going to be a challenge now with, as you heard Bill talk about this morning, um, any new money in the, getting any new money this session or in the next couple of years is going to be tough, but we are going to try and make the case. And we definitely want to save SHIP as well, because <laughs> SHIP is going to be, has to work hand in glove with everything we do. Um, the third intervention is all around reducing access to fruit and candy and menthol flavored tobacco products. 
We know through their words, their writing, their documents, that the tobacco industry uses these flavors to attract the high school student, the cornerstone of their market, um, and that's really concerning. In 2009, the federal government passed kind of a wide sweeping tobacco, um, tobacco bill, which was great. First time ever the FDA was given the authority to regulate tobacco. It took up to 2009, believe it or not. One thing that, that that bill said is that you can no longer have candy flavored or flavored cigarettes except menthol. It didn't touch other tobacco products, okay? So we saw this explosion in the marketplace since 2009 of flavored other tobacco products. So yes, we see cherry and winter flavored chew, but also candy and fruit flavored blunt wraps that kids use to smoke tobacco as well as other stuff. Um, we also see an increase in little cigars, Swiffer sweets, um, lots of low cost candy flavored products that you can buy two for a dollar, single pack, you know, single or double packs. Um, and that's very intentional, you know, that's, that's the tobacco industry really thinking how can they get their customer in the door um, with a low price point with, um, with these flavors that appeal to kids. Because if you're a 45, 50 year old, two pack a day, three pack a day smoker, you're not smoking great cigarillos, right? <laughs> Um, another problem is menthol. Um, so with menthol flavored tobacco, this is not only a problem, um, a big problem with youth. It is here in Minnesota, we're seeing like a double, uh, youth use has doubled of menthol cigarettes, but also primarily with the African American community. So of the general population, about 30, 35% smoke menthols in the African American community over 80% of smokers smoke menthol cigarettes. And this is very intentional too. Again, the tobacco industry has been targeting these communities since the 50s, really using images and iconic, iconic images and um, slogans from their different cultures um, to prey on these communities. And so a lot of communities say, hey, I saw myself in there. I felt reinforced, this is great. But really it's just all about making profit, right? So that's really concerning. Um, Here's some data on menthol. I won't go into it, but it's in it's in the materials, and I'm happy to talk more about it. We're really serious about if we're going to prevent youth use, we got to crack down on menthol too. And it's really been difficult since the feds gave it an exemption. This is this that was negotiated by the tobacco industry to get that exemption. So while those progress in 2009 was great, that exemption has really been challenging for states to deal with. But we want to be one of the first states to really take on menthol. Minneapolis and St. Paul were one of the first states in the country to prevent, um, to say you have to, if you're gonna sell candy and fruit flavor, we're gonna take them out of the convenience stores and gas stations where kids go every day, and we can only sell them now in adult-only tobacco shops. That's awesome. We wanna get menthol added to this in 2017, 2018. So that's really the next step. The first step about candy and fruit flavors was fantastic, really groundbreaking work here in Minnesota and across the country. We have a couple other communities looking to do this as well. Now the next step is to add menthol to that. Okay, and finally, Tobacco 21. I'm really excited about this one as well. It's kind of building a lot of momentum around the country. Um, when we first adopted it as one of our four areas, there was just kind of some initial evidence coming out that it was working, but then in 2015, the Institutes of Medicine, IOM, came out with a, like a landmark report that showed that if we were to increase the age to purchase from 18 to 21, we'd see a 25% reduction just among 17, 15 to 17 year olds. That's huge. Um, we don't have a ton of empirical evidence yet because even though there's been a lot of states and communities, well, two states and over 200 uh, cities that have done it, we don't have a lot of empirical evidence yet coming because it's so new. One community that was able to do some really good evaluation after they passed this in 20, uh, 2005 showed that their high school smoking rate was cut in half. So. That's great, that was one community in Massachusetts and we hope that as more empirical data comes out, it just reinforces that this is indeed the right way to go. What's really interesting and just an important point that as I was learning about this issue kind of was the big aha to me, um, most kids don't go out and try to buy cigarettes themselves, they get them from older friends in high school. So high school setting is where you have both, you know, 
legal smokers and illegal smokers. And so they're in the same space, and so that's where the peer-to-peer -peer happens. If we're able to just take tobacco, commercial tobacco and cigarettes out of the high school space, then that's gonna be what, uh, what reduces um, that peer-to-peer -peer pressure, that peer-to-peer -peer, um, social network, that, that's how the distribution really works. Um, you know, there's great public support for this. A lot, you know, you'll say, hear opposition arguments if you're 18 and join the military, shouldn't you be 18, you know, to smoke? You know, we have great messages to take that on, and for the most part, the public is with us across the country and in Minnesota. It's great support among smokers as well. Smokers say, man, I wish I would have never started. Do everything you can to prevent kids from ending up like me, having this terrible addiction and the, and the health consequences that I've suffered. So um, I think we're on the right track. 200 communities in, across the country have already done this. California and Hawaii as well. Illinois had it so close at their state level last year, and there's um, a handful of states that are really on the cusp. I put us on the second tier of that, and that we'd love to get a few communities to pass it first and then go statewide. But hopefully this year, at least, we'll get a bill introduced. We'll see. Um, and again, just want to reinforce that the tobacco industry is fighting us every step of the way. They are definitely morphine um, to appeal to kids of today. They do some crazy stuff. Um, they're not able to have cartoons. They're not able to, uh, you know, advertise on TV or with billboards. But they're still able to reach our youth through social media um, and and through giveaways, through concert tickets, um, you know, through couponing. There's a lot of different avenues that they have, and so we, we need to be aware that just because we don't see it as non-smoking adults, they're out there and they definitely have a target um, on the next generation, and that's why we need to stay true to it as well. These are the ones that motivate me. These are my kiddos, and I think by the time they're in high school, if we can get tobacco products, commercial tobacco products, cigarettes and chew and all that crap out of that high school environment, they'll have a lot better chance of um, emerging from high school, um, never have tried smoking, which is great because we know that that 95% of smokers start before 21, 90% before 18, okay? So if we, and the tobacco industry knows this too, they knew it before we did. So if we can prevent um, that stop, start, if we can stop the start, then if we get them, if, if we prevent that before they're 21, then they've lost the, another loyal customer and that's what we that's where we want to go so with that i'm going to turn it over oh any final yeah no, I just slippers yeah about. slippers barbecue sauce darts i mean you name it they, <laughs> they get slippers is that an incentive? yeah yep for playing games online for playing um you know doing the camel hump day uh you know if you text so many times then you accumulate points and we'll send you stuff in the mail and you know, may, you know you'll have this brand loyalty you'll feel more comfortable sharing information with us about your purchasing habits etc so yeah it's very sophisticated and and pretty sick so wow i mean what you're up against and yet also how hopeful about what the possibilities that are so i would like to uh just say a little bit about apple tree dental and then turn it over to and, and lay the groundwork for our grant and um, uh, how we got involved with this. Um, so, and then I'll turn it over to Karen Engstrom and she will talk with you about the actual tobacco cessation program uh, that we have implemented. So, Apple Tree, many of you know, our mission is to improve the oral health of all people, including those with special access needs who face barriers to care. And over the years, um, that, that special access needs and barriers to care has come to symbolize that it's not just elders in nursing homes or people with disabilities, it can be geographic, financial, other barriers to care. And um, we do have here in Minnesota six centers for dental health, shown as the red dots. Uh, we serve uh, regions around those centers and our patients, including through our mobile dental offices, which go out to 130 community sites in those green uh, shaded areas. And our patients are people across the lifespan, all ages, all abilities. Um, and in fact, uh, 
last year we uh, served 30,000 patients through these uh, and provided about 80,000 or over 80,000 dental visits, so a significant effort. And we're known, uh, very well known for our mobile dental offices that can be in a group home or a, a nursing home, a school, a Head Start facility, uh, a mental health campus. And all of these sites are linked back through our Centers for Dental Health, which are also clinics, via a cloud-based electronic health record. And as we develop this program, you'll see that that electronic health record um, was a significant uh, piece of our efforts and also that apple tree is in phase two meaningful use of our electronic health record and having a public health measure such as tobacco is an important part of, of meaningful use um, so we are very grateful to clearway uh, minnesota for the opportunity to receive a grant to help support all the planning and and uh, programming in the electronic health record and so on that uh, uh, have gone into our program and the leadership, Karen and Dr. Helgeson and others, believe that dental practices are an underutilized resource with a tremendous potential to impact tobacco cessation. And we're a nonprofit safety net provider, and we treat a lot of Minnesota health care program patients. And you saw earlier that the smoking rates, this is a health equity issue and impacting people differentially. So we feel like we are in a good uh, position to do this uh, on behalf of our patients. Uh, so the grant is for two years, began um, in May of 15, and will go through uh, next spring. Uh, our goals are to fo foster a reduction in tobacco utilization amongst our patients and in to improve our ability to assess patients' tobacco use and their interest in quitting. You know, uh, sort of a permission-based thing, find out where they are at first, and then provide education and other resources and intervention referrals so that uh, they are able to succeed in that and um, what Karen will talk to you about is the means that we used uh, to develop uh, this program. Uh, the, the planning team included representatives for each one of those centers that you saw so this our, our staff was really truly engaged in a team effort to make this happen and strong support and vision from our leadership uh, including uh, Dr. Teresa Johnson uh, who is the Education and Quality Assurance Director and uh, uh, Brenda Proza, who's our information systems director, because there are a lot of software enhancements and so on to be coordinated with this, and Karen Ingstrom, our chief operating officer. So part of the planning and the leadership vision on this is what are the barriers to quitting? Why do patients think they can't quit? And you'll see here there's just a list of, of, of common barriers or perceived barriers to uh, why quitting, why they might fail if they uh, tried to quit. Um, and I guess these kind of underscore the fact that this is an addiction and it is something that we want to help our patients um, address. But there's good news, despite those concerns. Um, people do want to quit. They actually want to quit. I mean, the majority of, of U.S. smokers indicate that they would like to quit, and for some of the reasons that Molly uh, touched on. And the same is true here in Minnesota, that people that are addicted would like to quit. And sort of in taking this to heart for Apple Tree, there's strong evidence that when a healthcare professional talks with their patients about that, it really increases the success rate and that it pays back in terms of patients feel that their healthcare provider is really in it there with them and perceive the quality of their care to be higher. Um, there are many overall rewards to quitting, and there's a whole list here that I won't take uh, the time to go through, but the planning team did really look at that and dig down to find out what are the rewards and what are people's um, expectations about quitting. And I guess the high level thing that I would say is that they're very individual and they're very meaningful. And maybe it is a cost thing that Molly drove home that cost makes a difference. And maybe it's like, do I put gas in my car or do I buy a carton of cigarettes? Or uh, maybe it's, uh, do I want to expose the kids in my household to secondhand smoke? So very individual um, and, and, and quite meaningful for people. So we need a system that helps uh, pull out whether people are ready to quit and why. So with these compelling reasons, I'm going to turn it over to Karen Engstrom. Uh, Apple Tree Dental's approach with our grant proposal and with our tobacco cessation program uh, implementation was with the goal to focus on a universal system that all of our team members could utilize in helping our patients. 
um, while also learning and capturing tobacco use information and data within our electronic health record uh, meaningful use system and, and with the standards that go along with that. Um, so this involved um, mainly uh, assessing tobacco use, um, educating our patients, uh, determining patients' interest to quit tobacco use, and facilitating referral processes. And um, it was shared, you know, this is a shared thing by all of our clinical team members. Um, also with the goal to collect the same data on all of our patients 13 years and older um, that are seen not only in our Centers for Dental Health, but also at our community clinic sites that Deb mentioned, at our long-term care centers, at the mental health campus where we provide dental services, collecting the same data no matter where we're uh, caring for the patient. Um, so why standard operating procedures? Why are they important? Um, certainly um, they're helpful in facilitating Apple uh, for us for our staff education um, to achieve consistency amongst our staff so that we're all calibrated and thinking the same way and how we want to go about this. And also to have um, you know, uh, some resources in terms of uh, you know, a guide for that. Um, the uh, standing operating procedures uh, also uh, clearly define what we will do and will not do. Uh, for instance, uh, we decided um, you know, for our initial program that we wouldn't be asking questions um, about e-cigarettes. Um, we may add that at a later time. Um, we also decided that at this point we wouldn't be providing one-on-one -on -one counseling to our patients um, or prescribing nicotine, nicotine replacement therapy drugs. We felt at, you know, at this point it was better for our patients to have that consultation with their primary care provider. Um, but our standard operating procedures um, also clearly defined what we, what we will be doing, um, and that was um, uh, defining how our patients will be assessed regarding their tobacco use, how we will provide patient education to them, how and when to offer a uh, tobacco cessation referral, um, how the data would be uh, recorded and documented within our electronic health record, and then the all-important you know, plan for the necessary follow-up steps um, so that we could really take this you know, from start to finish and, and be able to have that follow-up um, as well. So further information regarding the standard operating procedures um, was that Apple Tree Dental, um, I think I mentioned 13 years and older, but Apple Tree Dental adapted elements from the Indiana School of Dentistry Toolkit for Dental Practices. Um, we found it to be extremely helpful, and if you're interested, um, it would be a great resource for you if you're interested in developing a program uh, at your particular dental practice. But we specifically, from that toolkit, um, adapted their five A's model, um, and the five A's model, um, we felt, would provide a really full picture to our staff from start to finish with easily followed step-by-step -step processes. Um, and our staff were highly receptive to this because it really helped them understand how they would go through these, this program and these steps, um, possibly over a multiple uh, appointments. Um, you know, and this is really helpful, especially at the beginning of us introducing the program, for them to really have a clear picture of how am I gonna do this? How am I gonna accomplish this? So the five A's being the first step um, is the ask step where we're specifically asking our patients about their tobacco use um, and then moving on to the advise which would be um, you know advising our patients about the health effects to smoking and the benefits to quitting um, and then assessing our patients interest uh, we developed a readiness ruler where on a scale of one to ten we're able to ask our patients where do they feel they're at in making a quit attempt um, and then assessing our patients who are ready to make a quit. If that, if that readiness ruler is high, what can we do to help them continue that motivation and find, as Deb said, what is that one individualized motivation that might help them actually make that quit attempt? And then uh, arrange for the patient follow-up um, for those who made a, a, a quit attempt so that we can reward them and encourage them to continue along that path. Uh, so we found this as being kind of the foundation of our, uh, of our tobacco cessation program. To further help our uh, team members understand how to move, the, move through these five A's of the tobacco cessation program, we developed a, a patient encounter flowchart 
um, a template, if you will, that had the five A's and the, and the uh, communication uh, language to go along with it, and the, uh, including the education approach. Um, and this uh, uh, also included um, standardized scripts to use um, in communicating with our patients. And then also uh, prompts for when we would provide educational uh, handouts um, as well. So we, um, I'm sorry, I got a little ahead of myself. We assembled ed uh, educational resource handouts, uh, which are embedded in the electronic health record. Uh, so we would be um, printing those on demand, as well as being able to do laminated copies for education at chairside. And then we standardize um, also our uh, clinician's approach to um, defining tobacco, the three categories of tobacco use. Again, so we could have some kind of consistency and calibration to how we would categorize our smokers' status in terms of them being an occasional light or heavy um, smoker. So that was helpful um, as well. The flow chart um, was designed to be uh, multifunctional, and as I mentioned earlier, it includes not only the five A's, but it includes the standardized scripts to be um, used along with those uh, five A's, and then also directions for efficient and consistent documentation. You know, how exactly is that information that's gathered documented across all of our um, staff, and then also again those prompts for when to provide the educational handouts and referrals. So again, it was all really helpful for our staff to have that outline. And this slide shows an example of, or is the the flowchart that we designed. Um, again, that has the five A's, um, and then the communication um, language embedded right with it. And our staff, uh, we received really good feedback from our staff um, because we were able to use their feedback and make this be uh, a good resource that was realistic and, and would flow easy um, for our staff. You know, especially early on when you're first trying to get accustomed to you know, asking these questions and um, you know, how to move through based on the question being a yes or a no. You know, if it's yes, they are a smoker, um, then moving into that advice step um, finding out what their readiness ruler is, getting into the assessment. So it really helped them have this as a cheat sheet, if you will, um, so that if they were a little you know, stumped on where to go next, they had a really great resource. Um, and so this was really something that we found to be extremely helpful. We spent a lot of time, again, developing in this, asking our staff for their feedback, um, and then tweaking it as well. Did you have a question? Yeah, I was going to ask where it came from. We developed it. Um, our planning team, you know, we have, um, Deb mentioned, you know, we had leads at each of our centers, a uh, combination of hygienists, dental therapists, um, and then Dr. Teresa, our education director. Um, so we put a lot of time, and that was part of what the grant was for. You know, the first six months or almost the first year of the grant, we spent, you know, doing our research, um, you know, discovering the Indiana toolkit. Um, and then, you know, building up, pulling out the pieces that we thought would work for our patients and our staff. Um, and so then the next step following the creating that flow chart of how the program would flow was to develop um, two educational handouts. Um, and this slide shows um, the handout that we put together on the effects of tobacco use on the body. Um, including the mouth. Um, we laminated these, again, so that they could be used chairside for education. But mainly it's used as a handout for our patients to take with them. Um, and our thought about that was that, you know, even if the patient's not willing to look at it now, by taking it with them, it's extending the message beyond that dental visit. You know, if it's, in, if it's on the counter in the kitchen, a family member might see it and create a conversation. Or, you know, maybe the patient will look at it later and really reflect on it. Um, the next slide, this shows a closer look um, after several versions of this as well, <laughs> which, you know, there's a wealth of information out there and it was really tough for us to decide, to, to decide what would be the key pieces to put on this handout. Um, but after several versions, we're really pleased with the positive feedback that we received from our staff and from our patients um, regarding some of the diagrams that we use, such as this one, um, some of the facts that we included. Um, this is another close-up of um, the photos that we used um, because some of our patients we know respond well when they can actually see a photo and say, oh gosh, that's what my tongue looks like, that's what my 
my lip looks like or um, you know my cheek whatever um, and then on this handout one of the things that I was really excited about is that we listed some of the short-term long-term um, overall rewards um, and benefits of quitting um, because it was really interesting to see what happens even with just in hours of quitting smoking um, and then what happens you know after three months after six months after a year um, so really again just helpful information for those patients who would really relate to that and discover that that's their number one motivation is because hey it really would make a difference even if they've been smoking for 30 years um, which my dad discovered you know could help you live longer by quitting um, so uh, we found that to be really helpful as well. The uh, second educational resource that we developed was online resources and links. Um, this has been very popular as well, especially for our patients who are wanting a more private or self-guided approach. My dad quit on his own. Um, and some of our patients, that's the way that it's gonna work for them once they've made up their mind. Uh, so some of the um, uh, links that we provided and felt uh, would be useful was the Quit Plan um, website, smokefree.gov. Um, the American Dental Association website has a lot of information, Centers for Dis Disease Control. Um, some of these websites and links have very interactive resources for pati patients that want to do this on their own. Um, they're able to uh, view uh, live videos, testimonials of patients that you know struggled with their quit plan attempts but successfully did quit. Um, you, they could sign up for text messages um, to help support them with you know reminders about quitting and things like that. So it was really interesting for our staff to discover you know all of the ways that they can help our patients um, you know get more education educated about you know how they may quit. Um, moving on, uh, this is a screenshot from our electronic health record of the actual area where the tobacco assessment is recorded on our patients. Um, so the top part um, is where the assessment, um, where we're asking the patients the specifics about their um, smoking history, including how long they've been smoking and what their, what their readiness ruler score is. So uh, we were able to um, develop that as well as part of that assessment step. And then the lower half of the screen are the fields for where we're able to document the intervention. What educational materials did we provide to the patient? Either that, that uh, uh, colored handout of the effects of smoking or the resource, online resources handout. We're able to document exactly what did we uh, provide the patient. And then also this is where we uh, record the intervention if it gets to that um, step to where they're actually wanting a referral to maybe call it quits, maybe to their um, primary physician to talk about nicotine um, drugs, um, uh, things like that. So um, these were uh, customized specifically within our um, electronic health record. We discovered, um, like many things for, tobacco, for our tobacco cessation program, that working together as a team has helped us um, uh, be, success, be successful. For example, some of our providers were concerned that it would mostly fall to just their area, um, but we really stress the fact that this program is going to be successful um, if we all work together on it. And if we all use um, standard standardized language um, and resources uh, to help strengthen that message to our patients. For instance, we all talk about um, tobacco use and our, and our tobacco cessation program consistently. Um, we all know how to complete the assessments. All of our staff know where to document it, um, how to provide the educational materials, you know, how to recognize those prompts that are coming up. Um, how to enter the referral, how to explain the, you know, the referral options to our patients, um, how to consistently all talk about the follow-up uh, protocols. So the entire dental team is aware and engaged in this program, and that's what's making it successful, um, that it's a team approach. Um, and that's you know, really important just in general with standardized record keeping and electronic health record um, meaningful use, um, that everyone is working together. So what progress have we made today? Um, as I explained, we developed very detailed standard operating procedures, um, as well as developed you know, our formal staff training, um, along with the patient educational materials. 
We initiated uh, part of the grant, a big piece of the grant was to um, have the funds to pay for customizations to our electronic health record software so that we could accommodate our tobacco assessment documentation and our invention documentation um, needs for meaningful use. And by the way, having had that done for Open Demo, which is our software, that means that other users, other dental practices who are on Open Dental are able to access those same customizations. And that was something that Clearway was really interested in, that not only is Apple Tree developing this, but it's going to help other dental practices have those fields and be able to collect that same data as they're helping their patients through that you know, um, quit attempt. Um, so we were really proud of that, and having a full-time, you know, IS director, she was able to work really directly with Open Dental um, in helping them understand what we need to customize and how it's linked to our meaningful use standard as, as well. So it had kind of a dual purpose there. Um, and then we conducted a pilot test after we had the Open Dental update and, and everything customized. Then our team leads at each of our centers did a pilot test of this. So before, because we have such a large staff, before we rolled it out to everyone, we wanted to conduct a pilot test with our leads. That went really well. So then Dr. Teresa, um, our education director, and I we developed um, the actual staff training and officially implemented immediately after the training sessions implemented the whole tobacco cessation program because we have those standard operating procedures they were able to just take that and you know go right at it and then we monitored those standard operating procedures compliance with our staff to ensure that all team members were fulfilling their responsibilities that everyone was engaging in it and of course that's ongoing we're continuing to monitor how everyone is doing with that. We made quality improvements to the standard operating procedures as well for the feedback that we received from our staff and from um, patients. Um, and then we've had some retraining sessions for those who felt like, okay, now that I've been using it for a while, here's the questions that I have or here's the areas where I'm having difficulty with. And we were able to re-clarify some of the steps with documentation and you know, how the full chart can be helpful to them. And then um, most recently, now our next phase of this that we just started this fall was to begin reaching out to our community partners. Um, so where we're providing those dental services on site, such as the long-term care facilities, our group homes, um, our mental health campus, our veterans homes, where we're providing care, to explain our tobacco cessation program um, with the desire to develop processes to um, coordinate secession efforts at those facilities. In other words, how can we work together with our community partners uh, to make tobacco cessation part of the overall care plan for our patients? So if they're at a mental health campus and they're receiving primary care, they have pharmacy access at that campus, they're receiving their social services, mental health counseling sessions, you know, let's team up with um, how, we, how it can be integrated with the dental care that we're providing at those community sites. So we're really excited about that. We developed some questions that we're asking each of those facilities and, and finding um, their level of interest, whether or not they allow smoking on, at their facility. Do they have a tobacco cessation program? If so, how can we team up to develop, develop that um, as well? Um, so, why does all of this matter to us as coalition members? You know, for me, I think as we were working with our staff, um, you know, and not knowing how our patients would respond and what kind of data we would be able to collect. To me, if we prevent, as Dale mentioned, the oral cancer prevalence, if we prevent one oral cancer case, that's a big deal. You know, so for our staff, you know, I think if, if they're seeing, you know, throughout the course of a day, maybe they see eight, ten patients, if they maybe only have, you know, one or two that show interest, you know, that's a big deal. Even one is a big deal if we prevent one. And even if we help someone, you know, become motivated to quit, and they do quit and have more time to live and spend with their friends and families, you know, that's a big deal. And so I think that, that has really kept our staff motivated. Um, and then lastly, I'll remember that we're getting really short on time. Um, but we developed um, uh, from the uh, meaningful use fields that we have where we're actually entering the data, we are able through, through our software um, uh, uh, 
query, we are able to uh, prevent or produce query reports so that we're able to track the number of assessments that were completed, um, how, and from that, how many uh, of them are tobacco users, um, and then also what percentage of our patients are tobacco users. Um, we're able to um, query the report for the number of interventions that were made, um, how many referrals to a stop smoking clinic, how many referrals to uh, their medical provider, um, uh, how many were really interested in our handout on the effects of smoking on health, how many of them declined intervention, even though they maybe expressed a readiness to make a quick attempt, but they weren't quite ready or wanting to have a referral. Um, and then again, you know, where those referrals were given. Um, and then the follow-up, which is really important now, and as we get into this a little bit longer, it's going to be really interesting to find out how many of our patients, if they were motivated to quit, actually succeeded at quitting. Because as all of us know, it can take several quit attempts before they quit. we're able to quit. So we're able to track how many of them were successful with quitting and how many were unsuccessful, but then still continue to work on them and building on that one individualized motivi motivation that they have for that initial quit. So you guys might have some additional information on why this all matters from all of our different perspectives. Well, I would just like to thank you guys for being interested yeah. and thank you guys for presenting great information because I, I, I really feel like uh, we've given you the policy, environmental uh, view of this, and I find all of that really compelling when you think about unnecessary suffering and, and preventable disease and health care costs. And then I'm very proud of uh, Karen and the team and doing the individual work so that maybe this will be a standard in, in dental care too, that we have an effective standardized protocol to do that. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If anyone wants to um, sign up just for our action center list to get updates on what's going on in the Capitol, uh, please let me know or I can your card or I have a sign up list here. And also I do have fact sheets on each of our four uh, policy priorities in the court overall. So I need to take those and just really the individual cessation services we can be loved with our robust policy agenda and we need goals uh, to tackle the problem of that because which is still the leading cause of preventable death and disease in yeah. Minnesota and across the country. So thank it's, you. It's